This is Trapeza TV, the table of heavenly contents. I want to talk to you about worship and our title for tonight is Sing to Him a New Song. Sing to Him a New Song. So please share this broadcast with your friends. Uh, invite as many people as possible to watch us. I want to teach you about worship. A lot of the times people do the songs and the instruments, but they usually don't know the revelation behind worship. What is worship? Why does the Lord want us to sing to Him with all our heart and to sing to Him a new song? Glory to God. So invite your friends, share with your friends, tell them the Apostle of Love is online. Glory to Jesus. All right. So we're going straight to the Word of God. See a number of people are online with us. My son Dennis saying hallelujah, God bless you, we love you so much. Sam Witty, God bless you, saying amen. Daisy Quinka, my daughter, God bless you, hallelujah. We apologize for starting late. We value your time and we value your input. We apologize, we've been moving up and down, connecting cables and stuff like that. So our sincere apologies for starting late, but we're going to move on the power of God with us. In the book of Psalm 33 and verse 3, the Bible says, uh, in fact, let's, let's just take it from verse 1. Psalm 33 from verse 1. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Ah, that's so beautiful. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the righteous. Wow. Okay. So, we're going to find out what praise is and why we need to rejoice and who the righteousness of the Lord is. But let's look at this same scripture in International Standard Version. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, righteous ones, for the praise of the upright is beautiful. Wow, I think that makes much more sense. The praise of the upright is beautiful. 
So praise has to be done by the upright. Rejoice in the Lord. Um, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones, for the praise of the upright is beautiful. The praise of the upright is beautiful. How amazing. Verse 2 says, With a lyre, give thanks to the Lord. With a ten-stringed ten harp, play music to him. Verse 3 says, With a new song, sing to him. With shouts of joy, play skillfully. Wow. Now, verse 1 contains the revelation of worship. The revelation of worship. Because worship contains praise. Okay? Verse 1 says, Rejoice in the Lord, righteous ones. For the praise of the upright is beautiful. If you're not upright, your praise will not be beautiful and it will not be accepted. Who is the upright? Okay. Now let's go back to King James Version. Who is the upright? Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. So let's start from beginning. Before you begin to praise God, before you begin to worship him, before you begin to thank him for all the great things he's done for you, the Bible says you need to check on righteousness. Who is the righteous? Yeah. Who is the righteous? The one who's given their lives to Jesus. The one in whose heart the Spirit of God fails. The one who trembles at the Word of God. The one who has honor and respect for the things of God. The one that values the Holy Spirit. The one that values the gospel of Jesus. That is the person called the righteousness of God. And the Bible says such a person should first start by rejoicing. So as you worship, before you start your song, before you start your instrument, you need to first rejoice. You need to have a heart of joy. What is rejoice there? Yeah, It's to be overcome with gladness. Think about that. To cry out, to shout for joy, to give a ringing cry. Imagine, to be overcome with joy. Yeah. So, usually, this is something I see a great deal in, in the church today. And as an apostle, I've got to sort it out. Usually, worship leaders and musicians world over, beginning from the United States, they've contributed the most to worship in terms of music. When you look at them, they tend to put more attention to the uh, perfection of their voices and of their instruments, but they don't put attention, they don't focus on their hearts, you see. Because the Bible says he's looking for somebody to worship him in spirit and in truth. So the spirit of such a person has to be a spirit that is contrite. The Bible says a broken spirit and a contrite heart he will not despise. So it's mean, it means there are certain sacrifices that God will despise. There are certain sacrifices that if you give to God, he will despise. If the sacrifice does not, does not come from a heart that is broken and contrite, a humble heart, a heart that values God, values the Holy Spirit, above talent, above skill, you know, above looks. Because see, we can put up a good show for you. You know, we can dress up well, we can do our makeup, we can do our hair, we can do our nails, and then we can sharpen our voices and make them sound so good and get the instruments in place. But there's the most significant thing, that's your heart. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. The Bible says those are the sacrifices that God is pleased with. At some point, he told the Israelites, I don't want to hear the sound of your instruments. He says that they are noise to me. Yeah? I don't want to hear the sound of your instruments. They are noise to me. So later he says in Hosea 14 verse 2 that come with words. Bring words with you. Say forgive us and wash us and take away our transgressions. In fact, let me just read that for you before I return to uh, Psalm 33. Very significant for worshippers today to learn this. Yeah? There, there is too much that goes on that the Lord is not pleased with. Yeah? We are in the vineyard of the Lord and we need to do things God's way. So a lot of times worship is done as, as a show, as a performance. And musicians are more focused on their skills and their abilities. And they forget that there's someone to be worshipped. His name is Jesus, the one who died for us, in whose presence we have to be totally humble. Glory to God. So if you look at, um, if you look at the book of chapter, uh, Psalm, 
glory to Jesus. Let me just get it for you so quickly. Psalm, uh, the book of Psalm 51, it talks about the sacrifices of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to get it for you right now. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Short while I'll have it. Yeah. David in Psalm 51 has committed adultery with Bathsheba and has killed Uriah. He had committed an atrocity in Israel. He committed adultery and then he killed Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. So Nathan, the prophet, comes to him and says, you're going to die as a result of this. But David was a humble man. So he humbled himself went down on his knees, actually on his face. He prostrated himself before God, which is what worship is. You see, most people think worship is singing songs and playing instruments, but worship is a posture. There's a posture first before you produce any sound, before you emit any sound, there's a posture. And David took the posture of a worshiper. He went down on his face. Worship, shakak in Hebrew, is to bow down, to prostrate oneself, to take the lowest posture that is possible before a great king so when you're worshiping jesus our hearts first must be totally humble and submitted before him and musicians hear me because a lot of times the devil gets musicians it's called the spirit of lucifer the spirit that promotes the musician above jesus you see satan was a great musician and he was created with musical instruments all over his body that's ezekiel 28 and the bible says it made him proud you see after he had become proud, the Bible says he was cast out. In the book of Isaiah chapter 14, you know, Lucifer was cast down by angel Michael. Okay, now the posture of Lucifer is what caused him to be cast down. The Bible says because of his beauty, he looked amazing. And because of his sounds, the sounds of his, music, of his musical instrument, and because he became rich as a result, he did trade and became rich. His heart was lifted up within him. And he said, I will ascend to the north. I'll present myself as the greatest. And I see this happening so often. I will present myself as the greatest. You know, I'm the superstar. I'm the celebrity. You know, he was called the morning star. Superstar came from that. The morning star. You know, the most brilliant star. Superstar. So he presented himself with his talent and his gift. And he wanted to be seen. He was this amazing great person. And that's what we call the Lucifer spirit. And the Bible says as a result of lifting himself up. He was cast to the side of the pit. Haven't you seen that with great musicians all over the world? You know, they, they control so many numbers. When they come to a stadium, it fills up. But then they die so miserably. And most of them end up in hell. What a waste of talent. What a waste of gifting. What a waste of leadership. When they ought to have just laid their lives down and humbled themselves before God and presented Jesus as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus forevermore. And I pray that musicians hear this. I pray that singers hear this. So that we return worship back to Jesus. And take it away from our talents and abilities. And take it away from how wonderful we look. How beautiful we look. You know, how gorgeous we look. And how popular we are. Especially in, in this age of likes on, on uh, you know, likes and, and followers. Yeah, this, this is an age where people are influencers in social media. Not knowing that our influence is the Holy Spirit. The power is in the name of Jesus, not our names. We live at a time when people want to front their names above the name of Jesus. And this is how the devil gets into people's lives. And you find people such a mess. Having done so much, you know, in this life. And then they end up disqualified. You know what Paul said? He said, after doing so much, after preaching this gospel, I buffet my flesh so that I'm not disqualified. Oh my goodness, that musicians would rise again. That they would worship Jesus again and stop worshipping their talent and, and their abilities and their gifts. Okay, so David kills Uriah and uh, having committed adultery with Bathsheba and Nathan tells him you're going to die. Yeah, in fact, um, let me just read this thing from you. To the chief musician, to the what? Chief musician. This is written to a musician, okay. As some of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Now, in the Old Testament, they cried for mercy. In the New Testament, we declare that it's done. It's different. So in the 
New Testament, we don't say, oh, have mercy on me, O oh Lord, or oh, blot out my transgressions. In the New Testament, we say, through the blood of Jesus, I've been forgiven of all my sins. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm washed and purified. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm sanctified, I'm justified. We have a song, you know, to that effect, a song that uh, God's people ought to be singing. All right. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. But now we say the blood of Jesus washed me from all sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. This time round, our sins crucified on the cross. We no longer bear it. Don't carry it anymore. So see the beautiful thing about the New Testament. Okay. And then he says, against thee only have I said that. So he's talking about all those things he's done. He's saying, I was shipped in iniquity and in sin. Did my mother conceive me? Now, in the New Testament, you're not affected by the sin of your father or your mother. Because the Bible says the fathers have eaten sour grapes, but the teeth of the children are not set on edge. If you read Ezekiel, it talks about the fact that the soul that sins, it shall die. So you don't die for the sin of your father. Neither will your father pay for your own sin as a child. Everybody carries their own thing. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, then the ancestral issues no longer hold on to you. But if you don't have this revelation, then you'll continue breaking ancestral curses for the rest of your life. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hallelujah. Now, Franz asks, are there changes on Friday broadcast? <laughs> I knew it was going to, he wasn't going to, this was not going to pass him. Franz, I want to teach on worship because we, we sing often, but I want to teach on worship today so that musicians, singers, and God's children get to know how to worship Jesus. This is what I'm talking about, okay? So don't worry if you don't hear musical sounds and all that. Okay, so David says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now we don't say, purge me, wash me. Now we say we are washed already in the blood of Jesus. We only activate it by speaking the blood, okay? Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Those days they thought it's God that would be punishing them, but no, God doesn't punish. It is your words that either bring you life or death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, okay? And then um, he says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation, uh, verse 11 especially that there's even a song to that extent in verse 11 that cast me not away from your presence take not your holy spirit from me in the new testament he says i'll never leave you nor forsake you it's different okay we have a better covenant there's something better today than what they had those days okay and he says in verse 12 restore to me the joy of your salvation and hold me with your free spirit now in the new testament our spirits produce a fruit of joy. We don't ask God to restore it in. Do you see the difference? Yeah. So if you've been singing, um, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew your right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You know, there's a song like that. Very popular song. But that song is an Old Testament song that should have been sung by David and the people of old before Jesus died. Now that Jesus has died, we say our spirits produce joy. God doesn't give you joy anymore. In the Old Testament, they say the joy of the Lord is my strength. In the New Testament, we say because I'm saved, full of the Holy Spirit, I produce joy from my own spirit. I produce joy from my own spirit. That's, that's the New Testament, okay? This is why it's so important. It's so important for worshipers to, to have a heart of humility, okay? Hallelujah. And then, uh, then he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and, and sinners shall be converted unto you. And then he says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, you God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. He was feeling guilty. But in the New Testament, Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. You're not condemned. Okay? There's no condemnation. In the Old Testament, you messed, that's it. That was the end of it. In the New Testament, you messed, the blood washes it. Let me, let me even shock you. Even if you didn't ask for forgiveness, God forgives you anyway. All right? He tells us to forgive people even if they don't ask us to forgive them. So he cannot ask us to do what he doesn't do himself. Do you see how beautiful it is? The New Testament is beautiful. I can see Terry. Terry says, hello, sweet people. I've been breaking generational curses for two years. And when I got saved in 1907, I broke them too. Did they break? That's the question, my dear. <laughs> Did you notice that the more you broke them, the more you wanted to break them? There are no more curses if you are knowledgeable of the word of God. If you don't know, the curses will continue to work. 
If you know you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, if you know that all things have passed away, everything has become new, if you know that you don't even need to cast out demons as new creation, because the moment the truth enters you, the truth frees you. The moment you get revelation of the word of God, that light dispels darkness. You see, the Bible says your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, so the, the entrance of the word, it brings light and it gives knowledge to those who are simple. When light enters into a place, then princes of darkness cannot operate. The devil operates in the realm of darkness. When the word of God enters you, darkness is dispelled. But yes, we cast out demons from people because they are immature. They have not yet fully understood who they are in Christ and what they have, the power they've been given, the authority that they've been given. All right. So, yes, it is biblical to cast out demons, but that is for babies. The Bible says deliverance, casting out of demons, healings, prophecies, and the things we do. The Bible calls them food for the children or food for those who are spiritual babies. When you mature and you reach certain levels, you open the Bible and you begin to read it, any demonic spirit that was around you just goes away. You see, there's a level. So breaking of curses happens when you're still immature, when you're still equating your sin to how you relate to God. You're still equating your performance to how God takes you, which is what the law is. Because the Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. That means where, uh, again, the Bible says that sin is not imputed unless there is a law. You see, but Jesus Christ removed the law. He took it out of the way. So you cannot then be judged based on a law that has been removed. It's been expunged. So now we are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The other one was called the law of sin and death. You sin, you die. That one has been removed. So now if you sin, you don't die. Ah, I just told you. <laughs> if you sin, you don't die. Why? You are already crucified with Christ. You no longer live. You died already for that sin. And so you're not going to experience double jeopardy. In law, you're not punished twice for the same thing. When Jesus died, you are crucified with him. This is why it's important for you to announce that Jesus is your Lord and Savior so that you are accounted as those that died already. So this time around, what we need to do is get the truth in. We are no longer doing fire, power kind of war. It is truth versus lie kind of war. So you get the truth in and the lie goes together with the demons that came with it. Oh my God. Hallelujah. So if you're breaking curses, you will break them for a long time. And you'll find if you make a mistake, oh my goodness, there's another curse that has come into my life. I break that curse in the name of Jesus. Hey, all you need to do is change your mind. Repent. Change your mind. Glory to God. So my dear um, Terry Lynn, you don't have to break them. Okay? And if you've said it once, it's done. You don't have to say it so many times. Oh my God. Mysterious dysfunctional. You haven't changed that name. Man, it's been six months and you still have that name. <laughs> Remember this guy. <laughs> mysterious dysfunctional. You are not... Yes, you could be mysterious, but you're functional, not dysfunctional. He says about singing, you take on conscious music that is not gospel, but also not secular. Okay, let me help you there. You see, it's important for us to teach about these things. Because people just sing and they don't know what they're singing. Uh, gospel or secular? Those gospel is found in the Bible. Gospel is good news. Uagelion in Greek. Secular is not found in the Bible. So there's no such thing as secular in the Bible. But there is something called gospel. Now listen to me. Separating gospel music from secular music is something that is human. It's people trying to do that to please God. What we need to do is to operate according to God's word. So if you are singing, let's sing according to God's word. So there's only one thing, godly music. All right? If you subscribe to separation of secular from gospel, then if a song is sung by the so-called secular musician, even if the lyrics are true and are biblically right, you'll still call it secular. All right? For example, if somebody sings, I just call to say I love you. I just call to say how much I care. I just call to say I love you and I meet you and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. What will you say? Is that a gospel song or a secular song? Definitely people will say it's secular. But the lyrics, they are all scriptural. They are gospel. They are good news. So that's the confusion people have, especially if you're under the law. You confuse everything. You think you need to perform for God to love you. 
What you need is the truth. So secular and gospel is not something that came out of the Holy Spirit. Gospel came out of the Holy Spirit. So there are only two things. You're either singing truth or you're singing lies. That's it. The Bible says God is looking for somebody to worship him in spirit and in truth. That is the book of John 4 verse 23. Spirit means a newborn person saved. Truth means based on the word of God. So the only songs that God accepts are songs sung in spirit and in truth. Okay? So if we go saying this is gospel, this is secular, then we are going back to the law. We are complicating a very simple gospel. Good news. If you tell me I love you, I'll, I'll accept it. That is God's word. Love comes from God. But if it's said by somebody who's not a Christian, they'll say, you see, that's a secular song. Huh? Or, for example, um, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Is that secular gospel? Mm. You see, if you're going to use something, it has to be consistent and it has to be used uniformly throughout. Otherwise, it's not true. Okay? Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad, yeah? That's Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, and a prosperous New Year, yeah? Is that gospel or secular? So we need to find out if a song has scripture and has present truth, then that's gospel, that's good news, all right? If a song, even if it is Christian or so-called gospel, if a song doesn't have present truth, then it's not true, all right? For example, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. That's unscriptural. There is no place in the Bible written that we ought to crown Jesus. We don't have the power to do so. Hmm? <laughs> that we are to crown him. From Genesis to Revelation, there is no scripture like that that says we crown him. Yeah? Are you getting me, people? Uh, there are so many songs that we need to stop singing. So, even... <laughs> Even before we cross over to those who are not saved, there are so many Christians who are not singing songs that are not scriptural. So we need to get rid of this secular gospel subdivision of music and just go for what is true. For example, if I play an instrumental song, would it be gospel or secular? Seeing there are no words. You see, there's a level of narrow-mindedness we need to get rid of in the church. We need to read a bit more widely so that we don't narrow things that way. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, mysterious. So I hope I've tackled your matter. You take on conscious music that is not gospel but also not secular. You're right. Actually, you're absolutely right. It's supposed to be music that's true with lyrics that are true. Okay. I can take a song that is purportedly secular and I play it on my saxophone and the Spirit of God begins to heal people. Why? Because I took the good news aspect of the song and left the negative lyrics that were not true all melodies are beautiful but a melody carries certain words with it and if those words are negative whether sung by a christian or non-christian they will not benefit anybody okay terry lynn is so amused by the whole thing <laughs> glory to god she says i have many people to tell this truth too many will not like me oh yeah you know we don't do this thing to be liked you know we do this thing because it's true the truth is not always that popular, by the way. You see, that's why when somebody, if I were to start gossip right now, of course I'd have more followers if I were to start gossiping. Especially if I start mentioning ministers' names and gossiping them and saying the bad things they've done. I'll have more followers than I do right now. But if we are not here just to be popular, we are here to heal a sick world. We are here to bring hope to a dying world. We are here to resurrect the dead, to heal the sick. We are here to reconcile the world to God. Because a lot of people in the world hate God because they've never understood who he is. If only they knew how wonderful he is, they would never hate him. So ours is to reconcile enemies of God back to him, sons of God back to the Father. And that, would, that one is not usually that popular. So when we tell some of these truths, for example, when I teach about the fact that giving tithes and offerings won't make you rich, some preachers don't like me because of that. Because it's their career. They make money out of tithes and offerings. And when I say that doesn't make anyone rich, you see, you, you bust their bubble because there's no truth to that statement. There's no truth to the fact that if you give your tithes and offerings, you'll be rich. But there's truth to the fact that if you support God's work, you will be blessed. 
There are many blessed people who are not rich because they don't know business. They have not learned business acumen. They don't want to learn how to handle money. So after you're blessed, then you need to learn how money is handled. And that's what we teach every Monday. Wow. Glory to God. Fran says, at what point in prayer do I focus on Jesus? After thanking the Father or after applying his blood? Everything is done in the name of Jesus. Even thanking the Father is done in the name of Jesus. I thank you in the name of Jesus. If it's not in the name of Jesus, it never works. But again, you don't have to mention the name of Jesus all the time. Now that you're a child of God, the Bible says, as he is, so are you here on earth, 1 John 4, 17. So at the moment you begin to talk, it just happens. Okay? Glory to God. So you need to be conscious of Jesus. And by the way, the word of God is Jesus too. Terry says, what about people who are clearly demon oppressed? Would we want to cast out demons to get them to the point where they can start discipleship? Yes, that's right. Those are the ones we call nephews. You see, in the kingdom of God, we are brephos. Brephos are those who are just born again. They don't know anything. They are the ones who depend on the milk of the word. After brephos, we have nephews. Nephews are people who are sick but don't know how to talk the right things. These are people we need to keep laying hands on. We need to keep casting demons out of their lives. We need to break curses from their lives. They are conscious about ancestral curses. They are conscious about demons. They are conscious about sin. They are conscious about hell. It's called nephews. After nephews, we move to a level called Pideon. Pideon is a disciple, one who is now in school. I have a teaching about this. One of these fine days, I'll elaborate on it. Pideon is a person. Uh, this is where we get pedagogos or pedagogy, which is the art and science of learning and teaching. So Pideon is this person who is now interested. They're beginning to do research. They want to read the word of God for themselves. They want to know scriptures for themselves. They want to operate in power for themselves. After Pideon, we move on to Neoniscus. Neoniscus is like university level. These are people who are now being given power to read and to do all that pertain to their degree. They know how to do research. They can open the Bible and read it for themselves and understand for themselves. They've gone to a higher level. Uh, Pideon, you'd say, is like high school level. And then Neoniscus is university level. These are all Greek words. And then after that, there's Uihos. Uihos is now a, a person who has qualified, graduated, and now can be trusted with work. In the Old Testament, such a child would now be trusted with the father's estate. The father bequeaths the estate to them, even, be, even before the father dies. The child takes over. Jesus was called um, the Uihos because God gave him the kingdom. You see that? After Uihos, there's Pater, which is now father. Okay? So Jesus moves up to the level of the father now. You see, the Bible says the Father and the Holy Spirit are now in him. In him is found the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He has moved to the level of the Father and he wants us to move to that level with him. That's why he says we are seated in the heavenly places. So if you're at the level of breathos, we still have to cast demons out of you, break curses. We still have to lay hands on you, blow over you all the time and things like that. You want manifestations of power, you want to shake, to know all oh, the Spirit of God is here. You know, you, you have signs and symbols that if my left hand is shaking, I know the power of God is with me. It's called breathless level. And then there is a nephew's level. This is the level where you're saying and you know the things of God, but your mouth puts you in trouble all the time. You're critical, you're judgmental, you're a, a what, what do you call them? You are a, a spiritual detective. You're the ones who walk around looking to see what's wrong, what's wrong with people around. That's the level of a nephew, uh, a spiritual baby, the Bible calls them. And so you shouldn't stay at that level for too long. You need to graduate from nursery school, which is nephews, to high school, nursery primary school. Paul said, we're not going to lay down the foundation of elementary things again. Hebrews chapter 6. Yeah, We are not going to lay down those foundations like repentance from dead works. So if you're always conscious about sin, you always are conscious about repentance. But Paul says we need to move beyond those things, those elementary things to higher things. So go to high school and start studying at a higher level. And then keep studying a bit more so that you're at university level. And then move to a level where you can be trusted with things. God can trust you with people. He can trust you with ministry. He can trust you with family. He can trust you. That is called uihos or a son. Yeah, those are the ones we call sons. Okay? Yeah, and the spirit of God um, to them is called uihothesia, the spirit of adoption. The one that returns you back to the father so that you can run the father's estate and you can be trusted. From there, then you move on to a higher level, which is pater, the level of fatherhood, which is what we call the level of, actually, I should have said telios before pater. Telios is where you're perfected. You see, it is possible to reach that level if you continue in the word. 
Glory to God. So yes, we'll cast out demons. Yes, we'll do deliverance. Yes, we'll break curses. Yes, we'll lay hands. We'll do those elementary things when we're at the elementary level. But you must not stay there forever. Graduate. Okay. Glory to Jesus. So, Francis, says, so the highest level of deliverance is not by casting out demons, but by the reading of the word of God. Precisely. The highest level of deliverance is when the word enters you, the light enters you, and it dispels darkness. Glory to God. Terry says, oh my goodness, you see, this thing is benefiting these people. Terry says, it seems that churches in America have everything mixed together. Uh, people come to church and don't grow because they don't know how to grow. You are right. I'll tell you something about the United States of America. We thank God for that kind of knowledge that God has revealed to the U.S. And even when it comes to technological advancements and things like that. You know, in the afternoon today, I was listening to the clash between Instagram and TikTok. The battles that they went through. Yeah, Mr. Yiming and Mr. Zuckerberg and how they were fighting for domination in uh, social media and those are such wonderful things when you start learning how these guys do their businesses and for that reason the world has information at their fingertips as a result but there's something that also happened in the church there was so much growth in the church without depth so much growth without depth because in the united states they know how to package them their things and they have the power of media much more than any other nation of the world so they package and then they put media there. So the musicians are looking good and sounding good and the minister is dressed well and is speaking well and he has all the charisma that, that is required and the choir is sounding heavenly and everything is so good. But the message is immature. You see, if you, if you package it well, if you brand it well and present it well and it's in media, people will follow it. But the question is, is it true or not? And I'm not telling people who have truth to be shoddy to, to give a presentation that is shoddy, no. Because our God is excellent. Oh Lord, our God, how majestic, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Our God is excellent, so excellence is required of us. But that excellence must be based on spiritual, in-depth truth. The word of God must be in-depth. So the church in the United States right now needs to go deeper into the word of God rather than just presentation and showmanship. Because the U.S. has led the world in showbiz. You know, from the... Um, wrestling, you know, the wrestling thing that they used to do, I think they still do it, you know, to sports, to music, to all the great awards, they all happen in the United States, you see. Because God has given them grace for media, grace for excellence. Now, United States, go back to the Bible and get into the depth of Scripture. Then your media, your excellence, and all those things will bear fruit that lasts. Hallelujah. I hope I've answered you well there. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Terry says, I possibly need you in our born again churches. My dear, that's why I'm on Facebook right now. Because we, you see, I'm reaching you in Massachusetts. Yeah. So tell as many of your American friends to listen to us as well. And there are many other ministers, by the way, in the world that have the depth of the word that we ought to listen to as well. Glory to God. Uh, hallelujah. Um, Franz says, your preaching is like a sniper. It, it hits where people are, <laughs> and are comfortable with, <laughs> with comforting lies. Oh, that it hits where people are comfortable with comforting lies. Oh, yeah, this is why I've been, I've been locked up. I've been jailed because of this thing. But you know what? I'm not afraid. I'll keep preaching it as it is. There are certain preachers that used to be my friends. They've stopped being my friends. Why? Because I spoke some truth that they're uncomfortable with. You know? I, I'm happy to accept correction. If somebody corrects me based on scripture, I will receive it. And if I need to apologize, I will publicly do so. I'll say, look, I'm sorry I got this wrong. And I'll be so grateful to whoever helps me to know the Bible deeper. But I will not accept lies and I will not accept things that are not re revealed from the word of God. Things that people just practice because they want success. There are biblical ways of doing success. So for that reason, uh, it's okay when some people don't like me anymore because I tell them truths. You see, glory to Jesus. I'm glad you are enjoying the truth. Terry says, I would not have backslid if I was taught my identity in Christ. I was still under the law of sin and death. You know, backsliding happens when you think God is angry with you. You can only backslide 
When you think the father is annoyed with you and the father wants to cast you into hell based on your fault or your weaknesses or things you struggle with. If only people knew the love of God. If only people knew that the whole idea of salvation was not our idea. It was God's idea to save us so that we, we are not condemned. It was his idea. If only people knew that it's not God's pleasure that anybody should perish. That's not God's pleasure that anyone should go to hell. If only people knew that hell was not created for human beings. Hell was created for the devil and the fallen angels. No human being should ever, ever get into hell. It's not God's desire. It's not God's wish for anybody. That's why he brings the blood of Jesus to wash you. So God is not looking at you based on your performance. God is looking at you based on how you relate to him. Are you cultivating a relationship with him? That is not based on performance at all. It's not meritocratic. It's not about by merit. No, it's grace. Something you don't deserve. But given to you by a loving father. You know, I was driving home. Uh, and my son told me as we were driving, we were in traffic jam, I tell you. So I was praying in tongues. And my son tells me, Dad, I feel hungry. Do you know, I wanted to stop everything and look for a restaurant to buy him food. But there was no restaurant around where we were. So my heart was so troubled. I said, oh, my child is feeling hungry. I don't have anything to give him right now. I wish I could just branch somewhere. I looked for any place I could find, but there was none. And I was in traffic. So I began to pray for him. The best I could do was just to pray. That is the heart of a father towards a child. And if I, a human being, the one who's still growing in the things of God, could have such kind of compassion towards my son, how much more God who is perfect? Don't you think he has compassion towards you when you don't have money? Don't you think he looks for ways to teach you how to make money? When you have made a mistake and you are, you are repelling even your own self. You are repulsive to your own self. Don't you think God wants to wash you the way a mother would wash a child who has soiled themselves? But most people backslide because they think, oh, God is annoyed with me. God is tired of me. I've committed the same sin over and over again. That's not true. If you were to read the Bible, you find that God holds you doesn't condemn you. He matures you until you grow to a point where the things that used to knock you down become a walkover towards you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So there's no more box sliding for you, Terry. So can I go back to <laughs> teaching about worship? Oh, you guys. Yeah. Worship is not just about singing. Lifting up of your hands is worship. Psalm 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be as incense before and the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. Lifting up hands, that's worship. The way you conduct yourself is worship. The way you do your business is worship. The way you work at your office, that's worship. The way you treat your family members, that's worship. The way you recognize when you're wrong and you say, I'm sorry, that's worship. It's worship comes from two English words, word and ship. Making God worthy of who he says he is. That's what worship is. So if he says, I'm a forgiving God, take that forgiveness, that's worship. You're making him worthy. He's worth his souls. He's worth his words. When he says something, he has integrity and fidelity to fulfill it. So if you act out that way, that God loves you and you receive that love, you're worshiping him. And so we can worship God with musical instruments as written in Psalm 33 verse 3. You know, sing to the Lord with all your heart. Sing to him a new song. Okay. And God is not just looking for a good voice. Even though those who have been given a good voice have a higher grace to reach more people, so much more is required of them. But you who might not have a good voice, you can still, you can still crock to him because the Bible says all creation will worship him. Everything that hath breath praises him. When the frog is crocking, that's praise to God. You see, God being a master communicator can take sounds whose frequencies are not pleasing and he can filter them and make them pleasing to his ears because he's the creator of all spectrum whether they are light or sound based okay glory to god ah francis we love our heavenly father he's wonderful god is not going to condemn you a human being might be angry with you i could be angry with you but god isn't that's just me just my emotion not god's emotion okay god's not angry with you the bible says in the book of romans chapter 5 verse 1 that we have been saved from wrath we've been saved from god's wrath because of being justified being made just as if you never say. We've been saved from God's anger. There's no more anger of God against you. The Bible says the anger lasts only for a moment. That's in the book of Psalm 30 verse 5. In the Old Testament where God's anger was seen as so hot and fiery, he still said his anger lasts only but for a moment, twinkling of an eye, and his anger is gone. Yeah? That he knows that we are feeble, we are made of dust. 
Yet in the Old Testament, if somebody did not have that revelation, do you know what would happen? They would be so scared of God. Because they see people falling down dead because they've been, they've been cast or something like that. You need a revelation of the Father. If you have a revelation of his heart, you're not going to be afraid of him. Okay? And if your own biological father was angry, that was your biological father, not your heavenly father. So you need to make a big distinction between your biological father's anger and his issues. Even the anger of your minister is not the same as the anger of God. There are two different types of anger. So you need to have a personal revelation of God himself so that the excesses of ministers, excesses of your biological parents, excesses of your bosses at work and do not contaminate the pure nature, unadulterated nature of God. All right. This is why I emphasize the word of God. Hallelujah. Terry says, would you go far to say that a person would make it to heaven simply by believing that Jesus died for their sins, but they don't grow? I was thinking about this since the love of God is so vast. I run into this belief among many people often. Yes, if you believe in Jesus Christ uh, and you have not grown at all, you're not going to go to hell. Unless you start speaking death with your mouth. Unless you start talking about hell. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. The only thing is that your ranking in heaven will be low. Because your position in heaven, the things you're going to do. By the way, heaven is a waiting room. It's not the ultimate place. We'll all come back to the earth, by the way. Yes. Yeah? People just go to heaven to wait for the rest of us. You see, when Jesus returns, he's returning to the earth. And he's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth and we'll stay on earth. Okay, so to stay with Jesus and to be at a certain level of dominion for eternity, you need to grow and to have a revelation of him. If your revelation is low, then you'll operate at that level, not too close to the city. You get that? Yet enjoying the love of God. But the love of God can only be revealed to you based on your study, your revelation. Okay, you see. If somebody does not know how to handle money, you can't give them a million dollars. Because their revelation, their skill, and their ability cannot handle it. If somebody does not know how to drive a car, you won't give them a car. Even if they did not ride a bike, you will not give them a bike. You have to get them to learn first. So for God to trust you with responsibilities, even in the world to come, higher responsibilities, you need higher levels of knowledge. Higher levels of revelation. Glory to God. You understand that? So yes, you'll go to heaven even if you don't know much of the word of God as long as you believe in Jesus. But your knowledge will be limited even in heaven. So your responsibilities will be limited even in heaven. So the earth is the place where you determine how you're going to spend your eternity. Okay? Glory to God. Now, the Bible says, of those who never got to hear about Jesus, the Bible says God will handle them based on their conscience. Their conscience either accusing or excusing them okay their conscience either accusing or excusing them did you get that so if there's a group of people and they never go to hear about jesus at all because there was no preacher god will use their conscience to determine whether they're enjoying eternity or they're going to hell okay so don't think that god will just cast people into hell for example children a child who doesn't know right from wrong never goes to hell when they die. Like babies who are aborted. Yeah? Babies who are aborted all go to heaven. Every single one of them. Before a child is able to make their own decisions based on their own words, if they die, they go straight to heaven. You see how wonderful our God is. I wish people knew him. They would never run away from him. People run away from church because they think God is about to cast them into hell. They think all the problems happening in their lives are caused by God. No, they're caused by your ignorance. You don't know who he is. And even if he wants to give you healing, and you don't know how to handle the healing, you cannot get healed. So you have to read the word of God to know how healing is handled. First, what is it? What's healing? How do you handle it? And then after getting it, how do you maintain health? Things like that. So God wants a good steward of the things he gives. Yes, he wants to make you rich, but will you be a good steward of riches when given to you? Some people backslide as soon as they get money. You know, in some of our cultures in our country, there are people who are known, the moment they become rich, they marry a second wife, a third wife, fourth, fifth, sixth. It's as if for them money is the aphrodisiac. It's the thing that attracts women towards themselves. <laughs> you see? So there's a culture like that. So if God wants to make you prosperous, 
And you can see this one, as soon as they get a thousand dollars like this, they're going to marry someone else. And they're going to disregard their, the wife of their youth. Then God would rather teach you to love that wife of your youth rather than give you money. Because it benefits you much more. So we got to learn the deep things of God so that he can trust us with higher things as well. Oh my God. Will I finish this topic today? The Lord is good. Christian says Christianity in America is based on trying not to sin. Exhausting. It's like God is saying go witness for me or get whipped. That is a nepios, a spiritual baby approach to the things of God. Okay. Don't try not to sin. Instead, live life. Enjoy yourself. Use the manual, the word of God, because in his presence is fullness of joy, it's right and the pleasures forevermore. Enjoy life. But read the manual. Let him show you how it is enjoyed. Life belongs to him. He created it. He has the manual. He has the operation manual. He knows the highest level of pleasure you can ever enjoy. If you follow his ways, good. But if you're sin conscious, you'll always be sinning. Oh, by the way, sin consciousness is a, is a political move. It is a way of controlling people in the church. So that they keep coming to church hoping that one day they will grow and God will help them. The moment a person realizes that they can access God directly, you'll find a lot of people leaving church and going to start either their own ministries. You know, it's, it's dangerous when you're using a controlling system. You know, herd mentality. Ever heard of herd mentality? Yeah? I'm the only one that can lay hands on you and declare you clean. This is how it started even with the Catholic Church. Only the Pope could forgive sin for many, many years until Martin Luther brought salvation by grace. Remember the thesis? I think there were 99 of them that he pinned on top of the, you know, uh, at the entrance of the, the church. And that's how the Lutheran Church started because they believed in salvation by grace. Before then, the Catholic Church believed in salvation by works. You have to be perfect for God to accept you. Martin Luther said we are saved by grace. The perfection of Jesus is imputed upon us and we are accepted just as much as Jesus. And we still have churches today that still think that we need to preach sin. We are supposed to preach good news, not sin. First and, and foremost, what sin? Sin is unbelief. Not believing in the great things that God says about you. That's what sin is. Doing something wrong is not sin. What Sin is not believing what God says about the wrong thing you've done. Oh my God. Yeah? But we thank God for the U.S. Without the U.S., would we be having Facebook, for example? Yeah, we thank God for the U.S. They've done great things for us. Without the U.S., would we be having some of these Bibles and their translations? You know, Great Britain translated the Bible for us to English, King James. And then the United States people started, you know, uh, distributing the Bible all over. They taught us about so many different things. You know, a lot of things we know about the kingdom of God, we learned from the U.S., but it's high time now the church in the U.S. got deeper into the world. They started us off. They need to grow higher now. Okay. In this new dispensation. Hallelujah. So, uh, there are people who are scared. They say, I've never led anyone to Christ. Will I go to hell? No, you won't. There are so many people who have been led to Jesus without you knowing, by just watching your lifestyle. They just watched you and got saved. I know very many people who watched me. I never preached to them. They just came and said, look, I've watched the way you are. I've watched the way you handle your strengths and your weaknesses. I've watched the way you handle when you're right and when you're wrong. For that reason, I want to be like you. And I tell them, for you to be like me, you need to know Jesus. I said, yes, I want to know him right away. Without being preached to, they watch my lifestyle. Not necessarily my perfections, just the way I live. And that attracted them to the kingdom of God. So there are many people you've led to the Lord without you even knowing. So you're a good soul winner. But there are those God has called into the office of evangelism. They do it in their thousands, probably in their millions. Please don't let that intimidate you. Find your lane, stay on that lane. Glory to God. How about those people who, for example, are handling like the camera now that is pointing at me. Yeah, Mr. Nzomo is handling the camera. Imagine without him, you wouldn't see me. So the reward I get for preaching to you is the same reward he gets too. You see, there are those who are behind computers. You never see them. There are those who are handling other things. Some are cooking so that the preachers don't die of starvation. God will give them their reward as well. So just find your lane and be focused on that and God will bless you. Terry says, can you clarify? You mentioned about talking about hell will send one to hell. <laughs> there are preachers 
that are just preaching hell. Turn or burn. <laughs> that turn or burn. <laughs> Listen, death and life are in the power of your tongue. If you speak something for a long time, it becomes a reality. You see, if you're in business and you're ever talking about loss, 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 we're making losses, we're making losses, when will you ever start talking about profit and how to make profit? So if you preach hell, people will become hell conscious and then they'll give up altogether because it's impossible to obey the law. That's why Jesus took it out of the way. It was the letter of the law that was contrary to us against us Colossians 2 verse 14 15 he took it out of the way and then made a public display of the devil traveling over him by the cross after that if you continue preaching something that's been overcome and has been defeated a thing that was meant for the devil and his angels why not tell the devil about hell say Satan you and your demons and your angels hell belongs to you but don't preach it to people because hell does not belong to people we are children of God. So we need to tell them how to become children of God so that they're not candidates for hell. So turn or burn is not the gospel of Jesus. That's, the, that's called the letter of the law. It kills. Hmm. And we are saying it boldly. Francis Apostle, what are they doing in the waiting room at the moment as they're waiting the rest of us, the ones who went to heaven? They're in school. <laughs> Jesus is teaching them the word. They're learning things of God. All right. And once in a while, God gives them a window to see how you guys are operating on earth. And they celebrate. Okay. So heaven is a schooling system as they wait for the rest of us. Remember, even for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus had to go to hell to preach to them. When they believed in Jesus, they resurrected with Jesus. They were the cloud of witnesses that Jesus went with. He ascended with them from hell. You see, those days there was hell. Hell and the bosom of Abraham was separated by a chism. You know, like a canyon. So the people in hell who are burning and the people in the bosom of Abraham could even talk to each other, but they could not interact. When Jesus went down there, he preached to them. The souls that were bound, the Bible says in Peter, the souls that were bound, he preached to them. They believed in him when he resurrected, he resurrected with them. So even Abraham had to learn more about salvation. So when people go to heaven, they still have to learn from the same Jesus. Jesus is still preaching. The Bible says he's... he's, he's he ever lives to make intercession for us. Not just for you who are on earth, but those who went to heaven prematurely. Like babies who went to heaven are in nurseries. They are trained. They are educated. All right? They, they are being raised up in heaven. You see? But God's principle will was that they are raised on earth, not in heaven. But God always has his remedial ways of doing things. That's why he talks about his good will, his acceptable will, and his perfect will. Yeah? God's perfect will is that you are raised on earth, okay? But his acceptable will is that if for a reason or the other it didn't happen, he'll raise you in heaven. His good will is that you are born still but for example, so you have to be suckled and raised up there in heaven by him. That's his good will, but not his perfect will, okay? The earth is God's perfect will. All right. Terry says, thank you, apostle. Sorry to intercept the teaching in worship. It's all right. You know, there are many people who have same questions as you, and I think they're getting a lot of help. Glory to Jesus. Okay, I'll continue the teaching on worship next time. I've got to stop there. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow because I'll be answering all your questions. So bring all your questions tomorrow. I love you so very much. Please share this word with your friends. Um, I'll be carrying on with teachings on worship. So we'll worship next Friday, but I'll also teach a little bit, maybe before or after, so that you get to know what worship is all about. Love you so very much. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.